Here's a quick word from our football educational partners over at the Scouting Academy. Listen, we've said it all the time. If you love the analysis and you're passionate about football, then you really need to check out the Scouting Academy. Whether you're a football coach, aspiring writer, or even aspiring football agent, the Scouting Academy is really a perfect place for you to learn and develop your skills as an analyst. With curriculum that spans over 375 years of coaching and personnel experience, the Scouting Academy offers you a 16-week online course that you can tailor and build to meet your needs and your interests. Whether you're learning about wide receivers or defensive linemen, you can make the experience what you want it to be. Listen, I've said it to you on this podcast many times. I've spent my own money, my own time, and time away from my friends and family because I am just this passionate about this game. And the Scouting Academy is the place where I really feel like I've learned the most I've ever learned about the game of football. It's made me a better analyst. It's made me a better person in terms of the coaching I do on the field. I can't say enough great things about it. If you have any questions about the Scouting Academy, please don't hesitate to reach out to Dan Hatman on Twitter or reach out to the Scouting Academy online via email. I'm open to all questions as well. Heck, I'm still even a student there myself. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I really think that once you learn all the tools and gain the knowledge that they have to offer, I really think you're going to be absolutely excited about the game of football again. This is the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. This is where it all counts. This is why we're here. This is why each one of us are here. And now, here's your host. And we are back. This is the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. I am Paul Pertichese, and joining me this evening, special guest, Sigmund Bloom of Football Guys. Sigmund, welcome back to the Saturday to Sunday Football Podcast. It's great to be back, uh, and it, it's it's fun uh, it's fun for all of us because it's draft season and we can stop speculating and start talking about real things that are happening in about a week and a half. Um, but also this is the time and you and, and Matt and so many of our colleagues and people that we enjoy interacting with, the draft is the on-ramp to all the big picture football discussions because underpinning your evaluations of players is an internally consistent idea of what matters. And Saturday to Sunday is perfect. Because what matters on Saturday when we put these players in uniforms on Sunday? And that's always the subtext of our evaluations. And then the subtext of that is what matters in winning football games. So it, it's a perfect time for the, I call it the football lyceum, the salon, where we can all uh, ha- hang out and exchange ideas and maybe in a friendly way, take out the sword and shield and bang away on each other's ideas and learn from each other. And I look forward to this part of the calendar as much as any part of the calendar in the football season. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a blast. Matt and I have been getting on a lot of experts in the industry. So much fun to pick your guys' brains, talk to you about these guys, see different perspectives. Last week we had Waldman on and we were joking with him that he might sit atop the Saturday to Sunday appearance standings. <laughs> but if, if it's not him, it's definitely you. And we love having both of you guys on multiple times a year uh, for years now. And it's such a great time and great pr- privilege to have you on. So let's get right into it. Let's start the quarterback position, and we'll start there because it's such an interesting narrative this year. Obviously, last year we have you know five guys go in the first round last year. You know Baker and Darnold and Rosen and Allen and Lamar, and then this year the narrative is it's not as strong a class, and people are already starting to look past this class and look at next year's class, which I think is a little bit of a mistake thinking that far out because I have some questions and concerns about next year's class as Matt and I are always constantly looking looking ahead. So let's focus in on this year a little bit. And right at the top, Kyler Murray, mm-hmm. your take on him, his ability to transition to the NFL. Are there concerns and questions in your opinion about his size, about his play style. I still believe, and I saw your tweet just moments ago, I still believe all this hoopla surrounding him is just for show. I think he's going to the Cardinals. And if so, 
What do you think about him, Kingsbury offense, yeah. and kind of putting that all together? Oh, it's so intriguing, right? Uh, Paul, we could just do this whole show on yeah, look at that question. And it's going to be one of the most entertaining storylines to come out of this draft. And look, even if it's all been a show and Murray goes somewhere else, wherever he lands, it's going to be an exciting and invigorating story to watch. A spectacular failure, spectacular success. Um, what it says about the organization that's willing to take a chance on him. There's so much things in this story that are unique, right? If we were having this conversation, Paul, back in December, some people weren't even sure he was going to declare for the draft. Um, and if we were having this conversation five years ago, we would say a five, nine quarterback is never going to go in the first round, not at number one in the first round. Now also on this occasion that Seattle came to their senses and gave Russell Wilson, the money he deserves, uh, Russ, Kyler Murray, not that Russell Wilson needs the money. I mean, he should give him a cut of what his contract is in the NFL, because if there was no Russell Wilson teams would not be open to Kyler Murray being a premium franchise quarterback. Now, to get to the specifics on Murray, the prospect, he's fun to watch. And I know I heard someone say, oh, fun to watch doesn't matter in valuations. It does, actually. When you, a player makes you enthusiastic with the way, and I'm going to quote Matt like 17 times, Matt, your partner, the problem-solving aspect of the quarterback position, it's so much fun to watch what he has in his toolbox and how he uses it. Um, some of the things about his game are breathtaking. He throws the ball with such little effort, and, and it's so easy for him. He has true arm talent. And at this time of year, we when we had good uh, Josh Allen. We're still – Josh Allen Islands get a little bigger, huh? Yeah. We're, we're seeing some, we're seeing some rowboats. <laughs> we're seeing some rowboats. Because arm talent is not the same thing as you can throw the ball through a brick wall or you can throw it 80 yards in the air. Arm talent is from all kinds of odd platforms and, and all kinds of just different situations, arm slots. You just know how to make the throw you need to make on that play. Again, with the problem-solving context. And what Kyler Murray can do, some of these throws, it, it, it makes sense that he's an outfielder, right? Because he just makes these throws like the outfielder coming in to get that ball and gun that guy down at home. Uh, he can make some throws that I'm not sure anybody outside of Patrick Mahomes can make in the NFL right now. Uh, obviously, he's quick and fast as a scrambler, which is going to uh, uh, increase your heart rate as a defensive coordinator having to face him. Uh, he's so confident. Um, he has just such wonderful touch and feel on his passes. Um, when he does play in structure, the classic, like what's well, a lot of the plays we saw Baker Mayfield excel on. He's, he's excellent. You know, he's excellent. at ex Like he, he'll take the low frame hanging fruit when it's there. If there is something about his game that is concerning, one is his size. And it's not that he can't see over the offensive lineman or have passes batted down or whatever. He just looks small out there. Sometimes there was the play against Alabama when one of the defenders, I can't remember who just reached out and grabbed him by the Jersey and yanked him down. And that's not something you see in the NFL very often. So his size is going to make him less formidable out there. Sometimes as a runner, you're going to be hesitant to use him as a runner by design because he can get pinballed around out there in a way that just you just don't want to risk your quarterback in that way. So that might make the tactical value of his him as a runner more as a scrambler or a play extender than somebody you're going to make a fixture and play a lot of 11 on 11 football. You'll still dial it up sometimes, but not the way you were doing with, say, Cam Newton or Colin Kaepernick. Um, if there's a Colin Kaepernick in this class, it's Tyree Jackson. Anyway, the other thing, and he and he and his confidence can be a double-edged sword because he overestimates his ability to escape. He overestimates uh, sometimes his ability to be faster or quicker than his competition. Um, the, uh, the, I want to say it's a concern, Paul, but I think what will be the difference, because I don't see a bust risk with Murray. I don't think he's going to bust. I think he could be one of those players that has, you know, some games where a defense figures him out and some games where the defense can't figure him out. However, it, what will the difference between him being a good quarterback and a great quarterback is the, is the way the game speaks to him. Because the pace is going to pick up on Sunday, Saturday to Sunday. The pace picks up. And getting those clear instructions from what you see, both pre-snap reads, and of course, you have, you know, if you have someone in your ear, Cliff Kingsbury, that's going to help until 15 seconds on the play clock. But he, once the ball snapped, reading the defense, seeing, understanding the concept, these things need to give him instant, true, valid reactions to what he sees. And sometimes 
when you see him in that mode in Oklahoma, you don't see you, you, static. His radio is picking up static. Uh, it's one year quarterback. I mean, this is something I'm going to give him. I'm going to say we try not too much to say, well, he'll just grow and develop. That's a big mistake we all make too often, I think. Oh, he could be this if he just grows and develops. There's a lot less growth and development in the NFL than we than we are are projecting right now. But he has only been playing it for the position for a year. If it's a, it's this wonderful self selecting nature of the draft when teams are rational, Paul. If Cliff Kingsbury wants him that badly to stake his career as an NFL head coach on him, then chances are he has a pretty good idea of how to make him work in the NFL. So I'm going to give him a bit of a pass on that. But that's what I'm most interested to see, Paul, is if he picks up the song instead of the static on his radio when he's looking at a defense and has to make decisions, not because the play worked, not because he can out quick or out fast or make some ridiculous throw, but he just has to use his mind to solve the defense. Yeah, I mean, there were so many interesting things you said there. Right at the top, you talked about the problem-solving capabilities that he offers, the the depth in the toolbox of how to solve problems on the field. And people constantly refer to that Alabama game almost as a negative. I took it as completely the other way. I saw him battle and be dealt with new problems that he had never been exposed to in the Big 12 and their defenses. And I saw him adjust and all of a sudden – second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. I mean, if, if, if football was played with five quarters, mm-hmm. I'm not sure Kyler Murray doesn't get Oklahoma back and win that game against Alabama because I think he started to adapt and adjust to what Alabama was doing. It just took him a little bit of time. So to me, I watched that game and came away thinking, okay, he's going to see a lot of new things at the NFL level, similar to what Alabama threw at him early in this game. But I liked how he kind of rebounded and and was able to adjust. And then they didn't lose 50 to nothing or 50 to 10. That game got competitive and that game got close. So I'm really intrigued by that. I also am intrigued by the fact that you talked about his uniqueness and the pizzazz and why that matters. I think it matters a lot this year because we'll transition to, to Dwayne Haskins in a second. If Kyler Murray wasn't unique, wasn't a, almost a unicorn in terms of how different he was. And he was just a really good top solid quarterback that that played similar and looked similar to Dwayne Haskins and Drew Locke and, and Daniel Jones, but maybe there were just less question marks about him, but he was the clear consensus number one quarterback. I'm not sure Arizona would be looking to move on from Josh Rosen. I don't know if they'd be able to sell that, but because he's so unique and so different, I think that's part of the whole package with Kyler Murray and why he's going to be the first pick in the draft. Do you, do you kind of see that? Like if he was, if he was more the prototype of a quarterback, do you think Arizona would be going through the motions here of taking him and probably trading Josh Rosen? No, I am mean, uh- it's hard to make an argument for that. There's one piece of this Josh Rosen puzzle that we aren't privy to, but you hear lots of things, things that you don't want to say because it's rumor or innuendo. I've heard three or four or five different versions of Arizona has soured on him because of something that's out of our view because people, smart people, Doug Farrar and, and, and Matt Waldman and other people have gone back and said, go watch him with Arizona. And a lot of the things that made him excited about us, even though his stats were terrible and the outcome of the season was terrible, those qualities, those abilities, those skills are still there. They're still apparent. Uh, and who, how could you ask any quarterback to succeed in the situation he was put in the offensive line, the, the receivers, just that the team was going nowhere. And the team, I think, knew it was going nowhere. So, you know, when you know your first year head coach is likely to get fired, it's kind of hard to get fired up for the games. But from a, and, and Cliff Kingsbury can say whatever he wants about Josh Rosen as a fit, but and Cliff Kingsbury, to his credit, isn't an offensive mind that you can pigeonhole and say he needs this, this, and this on his shopping list because he has adapted to the personnel he's had at different stops. But you can do so much more with Kyler Murray than you can do with Josh Rosen. Not that you can't do things with Josh Rosen, but it's limited. He has a limited NFL application. Uh, Kyler Murray, there's not a lot of limitations of what you can do with him as a, a quarterback. So it would make sense to say... Look, the Kingsbury hire in and of itself is something, Paul, that we're going to go back as and, and Zach Taylor too, but you know, Cincinnati. I mean, Cincinnati probably there was a good joke that was like Cincinnati. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Betts that said like, Cincinnati hired him because he knows how to get to use the University of Cincinnati facilities for free for practice. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like they're just trying to like save ten thousand dollars at the margin, and they gave all of their head coach candidates like a number, and whatever one would take that number is the one they hired. So. 
But Zach Taylor and Caleb Kingsbury are the two hires that seemed the copycat league, right? It's still a copycat league. They're trying to copycat Sean McVay. Um, you bring in Cliff Kingsbury and you say, you are now steering our franchise because it's certainly not Steve Kime. And he says, I want Cliff Kingsbury. Then if you trust him, I mean, I want Kyler Murray. Then if you trust him, you let him take Kyler Murray and you work it from there. So I do think it's exciting to consider an innovative offensive mind with a quarterback that has very few limitations. And, and Paul, we can rewind conversations that we were having 10 or 15 years ago when the people in draft Twitter or the people that were writing about the draft were doing it truly because they just loved it and were fascinated by it. There wasn't really a draft industry the way there is now. And you would hear things like, well, college offenses don't work. He proved he can succeed in a college offense, but not a pro offense or taking snaps under center. He has to be able to do that. Uh, and now those things aren't even in the conversation. We evaluate quarterbacks. So it is the right time for a quarterback like Kyler Murray. And hopefully he'll go to an organization in Arizona that unlike Seattle, who at least was willing to pay Russell Wilson, they won't make him the centerpiece of their offense. He will be the centerpiece of the offense in Arizona. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be fascinating stuff. And, you know, as the Giants fan in me, I'm still hoping it somehow yeah. means Josh Rosen ends up in New yeah. York and maybe they're downplaying the interest, you know, to kind of see, you know, at what value they could get him. But uh, I guess we'll find out in a couple of weeks uh, in terms of what the Giants think about Rosen and, and some of these other quarterbacks. And speaking of these other quarterbacks, let's go through a couple others in, in rapid fire and then we'll yeah. transition to a new position. You've been on record of stating your questions or potential limitations that you see in Dwayne Haskins. Is it something I, I've heard you mention the name Byron Leftwich before? Is it more the experience, the delivery and release, the lack of maybe NFL pros in that Ohio State offense? What has you, or a combination of all of those things, what has you most concerned about? potentially Dwayne Haskins transitioning to, you know, above average to good NFL quarterback, potentially. It's the limitations. Uh, unlike Kyler Murray, he's a limited quarterback and he's going to need a lot of functional space around him to be a quality NFL passer. So unlike a Kyler Murray, you, you really need ideal conditions around him for him to excel. You know, think Peyton Manning, um, the idea with Peyton Manning was get him off his spot, get him off his spot, and you have a much better chance of winning the play. Um, and like a Peyton Manning, Dwayne Haskins is not great at creating his own space and negotiating the pocket. By and much like, and I know he has the big windup and the big step of Byron Leftwich, but like Byron Leftwich, without that functional space, without a good offensive line, and hey, the Giants, if they do go for Haskins. They have assembled now an offensive line that they can consider, and with the players they have around him, he can work just like Josh Rosen could work in that offense. Um, but Haskins, if you ask him to, his footwork and his ability to set up and make those odd platform throws, it's not as exciting. It's it's even a negative at times because he trusts his arm. And there is a, also a commonality with Leftwich where you watch his mechanics, and it's all arm. Uh, which I, again, which I think makes him more susceptible to having a slide in results whenever he gets pushed off his spot. So I just think that he's a quarterback that when you take him, you know that these are the optimal conditions for him. And if you can't provide those conditions, he's not going to be able to adapt. Uh, he's not going to be able to fit in a lot of different kinds of offenses. So he actually kind of makes sense for the Giants, but at the same time, I can buy because I'm biased and I just I, I have some faith in my own evaluations. This late breaking stuff, Paul, that well, maybe the NFL isn't as high on him as the media. Maybe he's more like the fourth quarterback off the board instead of the second. I had Eric Galco on my show and he said, hey, if Jacksonville or team doesn't take him early. He may fall all the way to the second round. I can buy that because I think if you're watching him and you're not looking at 50 touchdowns and eight interceptions or whatever numbers and you're just watching him. You, you say, this is what you can do with him. This is what you can't do with him. And as soon as you say that, now we're getting outside of the range of a franchise quarterback. As soon as you say, well, in this situation, he, he'll work. But in these situations, he's going to be neutralized. That's not a quarterback I would take in the first half of the first round. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, I think those are viable concerns. You know, the the system and the, and the surrounding cast are something that's going to be really viable. And I thought you made a good point. Giants continue to build up that O-line. They're probably going to get a start in right tackle in the draft in one of their first couple of picks. And their receivers, short, intermediate guys, Shepard, right. you know, Tate now, uh, Barkley out of the backfield, Evan Ingram. Maybe it does kind of fit. Again, the Giants have the Giants have been connected and disconnected to just about every quarterback in this <laughs> yeah. first round. So, so maybe Gettleman is using the media a little bit more than years past when it seemed always to be very obvious what the Giants were going to do. You know, last year they were pretty much circled in on Barkley, but that was a little different. When you have the second pick, you kind of can be, especially when you knew Cleveland wasn't going to take him. So, it, it's interesting to see. I know he's coming into New York today for. Uh, for a visit, they obviously sent a big contingency there, but then you hear other reports that they're not interested at all. So going to be fascinated with Dwayne Haskins to kind of see where he lands and if they have that system in place where maybe he can be successful. Any quick thoughts? Mm-hmm. Were you at the Senior Bowl this year, Sig? I forget. Just for one day, just to, okay. just to shake hands and give bro hugs, you know? Gotcha. So Drew Locke, Daniel Jones, and Will Greer all were at the Senior Bowl. Yep. They seem to be consensus the guys who are most talked about as the next three quarterbacks probably Jones and Locke in round one for whether they deserve it or not and Greer most likely next on the list for most people in terms of public persona any thoughts on them like Greer Greer is one of those guys to me who didn't look good at the senior bowl but I I feel like he's one of those guys who's never going to look good in practice situations but you put the game on Right. All of a sudden, he shines. And then a guy like Drew Locke is going to look good because he's got the big arm and he's got mobility. And the NFL loves Daniel Jones, and I, I'm still struggling with that. Yeah, as, exactly. as, as, as why, besides he's tall, the, the David Cutcliffe the stuff like yeah. that, the pieces, I, I don't know. I, I'm All three of them are fascinating to me to, to kind of to make sense of the level of interest and why or, or what the NFL sees. Yes, and it's and again, this is all the Rorschach ink blot, and uh, uh, it's it's there for every player in every position in the draft, but none more so than quarterback. And you laid it out really well, Paul, because what you're going to find is whether it's us talking and doing our armchair evaluations or the team. I love to say teams can't lie in the draft. When, we, when you put that name on that card, you're telling the truth about what you think matters what you think about a player, maybe what you think about your own roster, what you think about uh, the positions that are most important on your, in, in your scheme. And these three quarterbacks and what they present, and for that matter, Haskins and Murray and what they present will give us a, a read on what teams think are important qualities at the quarterback position, right? Because, and, and I'll steal from Matt Waldman and say that Daniel Jones is the quarterback that appeals to old school thinking. And I'm, I'm sure that when I say that as a Giants fan, that just send like shivers through you. you Cringe worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, that's something we might apply to other things Dave Gettleman has done, but you see these individual pieces, athleticism or pet, some sort of pedigree or something. And, 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 Oh, you can work with him in a scheme or something like that. Um, size, but the, but you don't ever see those things integrate. I love Matt Waldman's uh, it. The it factor is integrated technique, right? You don't see any of these things integrate. I, I said on our show talking about Daniel Jones that the sum is less than the parts. Drew Lock is similar, although Drew Lock is more of that beauty contest quarterback, as you said, in a practice setting where you're just looking at these individual. You know, Drew Lock. Sometimes the ball comes out a la Kyler Murray. It's so easy. It's so easy for him to put the ball in a spot 45 yards downfield or something like that. And he's athletic. And, uh, you know, the name like Jay Cutler comes to mind when you watch him, where it's uh, more of a tease that you see, you see it all come together on a plays on plays here and there. But when you watch him in a general sense, and again, when we're watching quarterbacks, Paul, I think the one thing we always have to keep in mind when we're trying to figure out what matters, when we're watching these games on Saturdays, what's going to matter on Sunday is it speeds up. Everything speeds up, and the complexity is going to also take an exponential leap. And when you watch Drew Locke, when the bullets are flying, you see more of a passive thinker. You see a muddled thinker. Um, You see that if he doesn't get the ball out of his hands early in the read, things can go south pretty quickly. Uh, And that's going to just be exacerbated in the pros. And then Will Greer... And this is one where I think a lot of draft Twitter loves Will Greer. And I think a lot of us like him for the same reasons. I think Baldwin loves him because he's fearless because he plays with an edge 
that that is the counteracting factor to the it speeds up and it gets more complex uh and you see in him um his he sets up yards after catch uh he's able to escape and be mobile enough to like what we don't always see from Dwayne Haskins is creating that functional space. Um, sometimes the, the, one of the biggest things I have as a big X on Will Greer's uh, evaluation is don't go backwards. He goes backwards too much. He trusts himself a little too much. Don't ever put it in reverse when you're a quarterback. Um, but what you like about him is he's aggressive minded. You know, we're Paul, when we're watching these quarterbacks, all positions to an extent, but quarterbacks, especially we're psychoanalyzing them, right? We're trying to to infer from their actions what 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 were you thinking? What was your emotional state? What was your psychological state when you made this decision? Because it's all about decisions. And again, back to your partner's framework of problem solving and Will Greer's problem solving. Unlike Daniel Jones, who at least, hey, Daniel Jones will like stand in and take a hit to make a throw. Unlike Drew Locke, who gets muddled and passive, he's aggressive, he's on edge, and he's ready to engage the defense on his terms. Yeah, I mean, listen, I remember watching Will Greer back in the summer, and Matt and I came on air, and we did our quarterback preview show, and we were like, if the NFL loved Baker Mayfield, I feel like they're going to like Will Greer a little bit. He's yeah. got some Baker in him. Yeah. And I all year I said he the, 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 the question about Will Greer is straddling that line between aggressiveness and recklessness. Right. And I think that's the biggest question mark about him. And it's going to be interesting to see. You know, he had apparently a great pro day and Adam Schefter tweeted out like, you know, he might go higher than some people think and, and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see what the NFL thinks of him. And then on the Lock and Jones narrative, you almost feel like there's some built-in defense arguments already that teams can spew <laughs> out because it's like, you know, like... It kind this of is a is. game, right? Paul, let me interject. This is a game, right? Is we should have write the post-draft presser statement for the team that takes this player, yeah. you know? And it, it's. I feel like it's going to be like, well, yes, Drew Locke had some issues here or there, but he played in the <laughs> SEC. He he had one of the worst surrounding casts in the SEC. So that was what led to that. If you put a better cast around him, you'll see less of that, you know, those limitations and issues you saw. And you can take that same thing with David Cook. I mean, with uh, Daniel Jones. Mm-hmm. He played at Duke. None of their other players are probably going to the NFL. In, in Missouri, it's probably right. only Emmanuel Hall. So I feel like there's these built in defense arguments already like to try to state their case of, of, of why they invested these guys. And if they do go in round one, trying to put the pieces together only leads me to believe that th- they think those statements are true, right? They, they must truly believe that if you put Daniel Jones around the better supporting cast, he can be a really good starting quarterback. Those limitations and those concerns when the bullets are flying for Drew Locke, well, if you put him around the better offensive line and not such at a disadvantage in terms of who his opponents are, he can he will be better in those aspects. Because if they didn't think that, well, then I, I don't see how their top 10, top 15, top 20 quarterbacks, you know, and guys that they're going to, you know, stick their claim to for at least the next probably three years, you know, you know, and then, you know, you can get out a little bit quicker now with the salary structure than in the years in the history past. But it, they must think that. So it, it's fascinating to see. And you're right. The day of the draft, we find out the truths about these guys. If the Giants take a Daniel Jones or a Drew Locke ahead of Dwayne Haskins, well, they just basically showed us their their board and they showed us their rankings. And if they don't take a quarterback, well, they're showing again that they must. Listen, I get that they keep supporting Eli. And what else are you going to say in the media? Maybe it's foolish. But if they keep supporting these guys, if they if they keep passing on quarterbacks, you know, I think they're being a little bit too petty and, and trying to find the perfect quarterback. And you don't always get the perfect quarterback. Trevor Lawrence isn't coming out for two years and probably no one's trading him in two years anyway, whoever has that pick. So it, it, it's fascinating. The draft reveals so much and it, it's such an exciting, thing, especially with the quarterback position. So we could do a whole hour, hour and a half yeah. on the quarterbacks. So let's transition to the running backs because the running back position this year very different than years past. Like years past, we have had these staple of yeah. guys that were top 20, top 15 worthy, round one worthy. 
And then this year's draft class, the only one you're even hearing that narrative with is a guy who basically was a committee back at Alabama in Josh Jacobs, who I really do believe his skill set and his ability to solve problems and that multi-versatile you know, tool set in there on the field warrants him being that guy. But besides him, I don't really see anybody else as a guy who has that such unique, versatile skill set that would warrant even considering in round one. Where do you kind of just mm-hmm. make look at this class as a whole? And you can just dig into some players that sure. intrigue you the most. Yeah, um, and you're absolutely right. So one of the things that we need to s- set the stage here is 2017-2018 running back classes were outstanding. There were once every five or ten years kinds of classes back-to-back. Um, and for a lot of the work that I do when we turn the page to fantasy football, what that means is there's not as much opportunity out there for this year's class because these great young backs on rookie contracts are are doing a lot of the work for teams. And it fits in some ways, though, because, Paul, I think what we've uh, watched, again, over the last 10 or 15 years, so rewind to, say, 2004, 2005, 2006, because we can go back to 2005, Paul. And you remember 2005 was the year that uh, uh, Ronnie Brown, Cadillac Williams, and Cedric Benson all went in the top six, right? If we ever have a draft where three running backs go in the top six, it's because there's three Saquon Barkleys, who's a once every 10 years running back, all in the same class. It ain't ever going to happen again. Nope. Because the running back position is devalued. But I shouldn't necessarily say devalued, because I want to make a point that the running back position is devalued when it comes time to sign them to a second contract, when it comes time to sign somebody to fill out your depth chart. But it's not devalued in the draft, especially with classes like the last two. Teams are more are willing to pay a premium pick for those fresh legs years at a big, deep discount on a rookie contract. Maybe they might not be wanting to pay the premium in the second contract. Uh, and we're seeing even other teams. You know, Tevin Coleman, he didn't get paid. Tevin Coleman got paid as much as some backups at other positions. So te- teams thinking is evolving. And I think it's because the position is more segmented now. It's it's almost two or three positions. And we're seeing the same thing with wide receiver. I love that we're seeing people sort out. I think it's a theme for both wide receiver and running back classes this year that to understand the class, it's better to think about them in roles and think about which running backs would do the best in specific roles as opposed to, like you said, you know, we don't have that special running back who has skills and traits that align and are married to each other in a way that they can add value in lots of areas of the game, except for Josh Jacobs. So I'm going to echo what you said. And I, I I don't like to have lots of hot takes in the draft and things like that, but a hot take I think that I would co-sign with is Josh Jacobs is head and shoulders above this class. And he is the running back that if you're going to spend a premium pick on one. And, hey, Jacobs might go 24th or 27th to Oakland. And then the next running back off the board might be just eight or ten picks later in the second round. But I think there's a gap here. And the gap is this. Josh Jacobs presents a very rare intersection of a powerful, rugged runner who brings that to all aspects of his game. As a blocker, as an open field runner after a receiver, he just plays the game with a chip on his shoulder. But he also is a very refined route runner. He's a tremendously dependable blocker. He's got good hands. He's very coordinated catching the ball out in space. There's the play against Auburn, which I you rarely see any running back prospect make a play like this. Even someone like Saquon Barkley, I can't recall a play on his Penn State tape where you saw uh, Jacobs run a go route out of the backfield and to it through the ball over the outside shoulder instead of the inside shoulder. And Jacobs flipped his hips to adjust to the ball. So he's tracking the ball and he flipped his hips without breaking stride. There's some wide receivers in this draft that can't do that. So the coordination and then again with problem solving. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to say this like seven. We have a little counter. You want to put a little counter in the corner for every time I say that? Because he, 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 it didn't, there's so many players and Paul, I know that you, you watch this stuff so much. And your brain starts to predict what's going to happen or your brain will limit the range of possibilities. So when you're watching Josh Jacobs on that play, your brain says, wait, did that just happen? Because that requires a a very high level of awareness, of perception, of of flexibility, of execution. And then, by the way, he stiff arms a guy. He makes two guys run into each other and finishes the play for a touchdown. And I think having a 
running back who can be a hammer, but also be a tremendous last line of defense as a pass blocker and a dangerous player in the passing game. Not just a player who can harvest value in the passing game, but a player who can add value. That's rare. And then you start to look at the next next group. And I'll try. And I'll, you know, we, we, I, can, I can tell, Paul, like, you and I could do a podcast on any topic and it will go three hours automatically. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but some of these other guys, so the next group, right? Daryl Henderson from Memphis is fun because he combines breakaway speed and acceleration with a willingness to win collisions, get low. And that's rare. And that's going to create chunk plays in the running game, the rare special chunk plays in the running game. So I like him next. David Montgomery is a very useful back. He's advanced in the passing game. Uh, he brings a combativeness to every confrontation on the field that you love. Physically, he's not going to add a lot of value. He's kind of a monotone runner, not someone with a ton of snap and suddenness and things like that. And he takes a lot of punishment. So, you know, Josh Jacobs, I, I keep hearing this thing about Jacobs, Paul. It's like, well, what? Nick Saban didn't think he was the best running back, but it means there's so much tread left on his tires. I'm not sure about the tread on David Montgomery's tires after the um, – the punishment he took probably the next three mile Sanders and mile Sanders is your like, see, I should try. I'm going to try to say something, Paul. Like I don't know anything about Mercedes, but I know there's like a class of Mercedes. That's like the highest class, the S class or the C class. I'm going to embarrass myself. And then there's like the Mercedes that like, maybe if we've got like a used 2001, like you or I might be able to afford it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Miles Sanders is kind of that affordable version of Saquon Barkley, where he has a lot of that same dazzling, physical skill set and the willingness to try to do death defying acts. And we saw it with Saquon Barkley that it translated. It's not going to translate quite as well with Miles Sanders, but Miles Sanders is one of the few backs in his class that you can see as an every down back. And he'll, and, and, and physically teams are going to love his profile. Damien Harris uh, was playing a little bit in Josh Jacobs shadow. If we're looking at it in draft app, NFL application terms, but he, you know, he's a determined strong runner, a, a versatile back. Um, you know, th- th- That's probably the, the next group, those four, Sanders, Montgomery, Henderson, and Harris. Um, and Sanders is the one that I think, and Henderson has underrated skills in the passing game too. So, you know, these four backs have the ability to be more than just one part of a three-headed running back attack, but Jacob stands out over them. Yeah, I mean, what's so fascinating, you went back to that class with Cadillac Williams and Ronnie Brown and Cedric Benson. In today's NFL, I don't think any of them would be considered top 10 picks because the game has changed so much. And you talked about the regular style running back, I think is for sure devalued the uniqueness of a offensive weapon. I I've came back to listen, the whole giants conversation last year, quarterback, non quarterback, that's a different talk topic, but the value of Saquon Barkley shouldn't be looked at anymore as just a running back. The offensive weapon that he is should be looked at as a guy of he could impact the game as much as an AJ Green or a Julio Jones or an Odell Beckham because of his versatile skill set. I think those guys still warrant being considered in the top 10 Christian McCaffrey's of the world. I mean, the one more, most recent who I, I think if they could go back in time would be the Jags and Leonard Fournette. Now they were trying to create that style of play that they thought he was perfect for them. But I think when you see, when we see running backs go top five, top 10, I'd be very surprised from here on out if they're not more offensive weapon who could impact the game in a variety of ways and literally dictate what defenses are potentially doing in a variety of schemes and, and plays than a guy like a Leonard Fournette or Cedric Benson or, you know, Cadillac Williams and those type of guys. And I think that's where the NFL is now a little bit different. And I think they still could go early running backs, but I think it's a totally different type of player than, than years past. So I think that's one thing right at the top that you said. I agree with you, Josh Jacobs, and I, I love that you brought up the problem solving because while you can use that narrative that Matt's been pushing for every single position, I do think personally when I use it, I think the running back position is the the one that I find the easiest to kind of see, you know, that that uniqueness of thinking about it in terms of problem solving because we see these guys adapt to so many problems and if you start seeing repetition of how they handle certain things you know that that's their way that's their solution to the problem at hand on a repeated you know instance over and over so i think that problem solving paradigm is so unique and and fits so well with the running back class and that's something that's really fascinating and all that next tier of running backs you just talked about 
I don't even know if necessarily the way they come off the board necessarily fits what the NFL teams think of them. And and by that, what I mean is I think it really – every team's running back board is really going to be unique to what they want. Yeah. Because if you're looking for a big play threat, a guy who you know you already have a grinder – well, then you're probably going to go, you know, Daryl Henderson or maybe even go with Justice Hill or somebody like that. But if you're looking for that physical grinding type, well, then Damian Harris, David Montgomery are more your guys. Like if the Ravens invest a day two pick on a running back, are they looking for a replication of Mark Ingram, which would be like a Damian Harris or maybe a Montgomery? Or are they looking for someone that kind of complements a guy like Mark Ingram? It doesn't mean, you know, in a vacuum, they have that guy higher than somebody else, but what fits them. And that's what's so unique, I think, to the running back position. So that is very fascinating. Before we move away from running backs, yeah. there's a lot of big, physical, power, strong running backs in this class. Mm-hmm. Is there one or two that intrigue you the most from, I would say, the group probably consists of Raquel Armstead, Dexter Williams, Devon Azigbo, Alexander Madison, and even further down, guys like LJ Scott, Benny Snell, Elijah Holyfield, who I think all kind of fit that same, yeah. that their athleticism varies considerably. But is there, those are the bigger, more physical guys. Is there one or two in there that intrigue you a little bit more than the rest? Well, I'll toss a, a, a different name in there, too. Ozigbo is one, absolutely, that deserves some more love um, because he didn't get invited to the combine. I have no idea why, but he should be a top 10, top 12 back. And it, 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 similar to, you know, we haven't mentioned Devin Singletary, but he has more size and more pile pushing than Devin Singletary. But it's that same idea. And with Montgomery, too, where every confrontation with a defender, he's going to get low. He's going to twist. He's going to ride. He's going to fight. He's going to push. He doesn't give up anything. Um, and I, I, I have a, a term, I made up a term for Ozigbo, Paul, I call it functional impatience. Cause it's not like he runs up the back of his blockers, but it's just that urgency. Uh, he has a great sense of urgency. Um, and he, I, he had something very unique in his quality. I, I, like a boxer, there are boxers. My stepdad was a professional boxer. I grew up loving boxing in the eighties. Um, there's a, a there's a way that a boxer can be defensive and offensive at the same time, right? Like approach you in a way that's not giving you anything to hit, but ha- with a plan to get that uppercut in or, or, or s- set up a combination. So not leaving yourself exposed while you're attacking. I'd love that about a Zeke Bo's game. And he always has a plan. I, you know, you mentioned this about running backs and problem solving. You can tell when there are certain running backs, like smoke comes out of their ears, you know? Um, I think Devontae Booker is a good example of a guy that we weren't sure how big of a deal this was going to be for him in the NFL. But if, if hesitation or having to take that extra beat to process what you're seeing at running back is lethal in the NFL, lethal for the running back. Uh, so I love that in Ozebo. You know, he's not someone who's going to win any dance competitions. He's not a burner. Um, he's not a nimble back in any way. But I think he stands out from that group. And I want to say that in some ways, Rodney Anderson as a runner fits in the big physical backs. And if Rodney Anderson hadn't had this plethora of injuries, we might be talking about him in the conversation with Josh Jacobs and that he's coming into the NFL at the perfect time for a running back that can be so advanced in the passing game, but also be part of your bread and butter running game. Um, Ezekiel Elliott kind of comes to mind. Dallas doesn't use him as much as they should as a receiver detached from the formation and things like that. So Rodney Anderson is a guy that we're all, we're going to have to read the uh, like how high he goes. Because if he goes in the second round, then some team feels really confident about his ability to hold up in the NFL. If he goes in the fourth round, then his team's saying he's a good running back, but we just don't believe he can hold up in the NFL. Um, Rodney Anderson is a player that doesn't get talked about enough because of the injuries, but purely evaluating him on tape, he's a, a wonderful running back to watch. Yeah, absolutely. He's still my number two running back. Yeah. And again, I'm just basing that on his film eval. Obviously, post-draft Dynasty rookie rankings will probably, I won't say definitively, will probably look different if he's a fourth or a fifth round pick and you know, team takes a flyer on him on day three because of that injury. But I'm right there with you. If he was 100% healthy and there were no 
injury and durability concerns about him, I do think he'd be in the mix. And it would be him and Jacobs in a clear tier by themselves yeah. before that next group of four that you talked about before. Uh, I do think, you know, all summer, you know, prior to anyone even really knowing Josh Jacobs existed, you know, and was going to be a high level NFL draft prospect and come out early, Rodney Anderson sat atop my, you know, my rankings ahead of Montgomery, ahead of Damian Harris, guys that were being talked about a lot since last summer. I think very highly of Rodney Anderson's game. And I do think he's getting a little bit lost in the shuffle. And again, we don't, we're not privy to those medicals. If he goes late round three or top of the board on, on day three in round four, I think that means that the teams are probably pretty okay with the medicals. And maybe he's not a, a, a guy that a team's looking at as a two contract player. But he might be a one contract player, similar to like a Jay Ajayi. People were saying that about him, and that's why he fell a little bit. But I think Anderson's skill set is significantly higher than a guy like Jay Ajayi and warrants being in strong consideration at the top of running back boards if you're taking all that other stuff out of it. So he's a guy. I'm glad you brought him up. He was going to be my last question before we moved on from the running back position. So let's transition this. I'm going to save wide receivers for last because I don't want tight ends to get lost in the shuffle and kind of just get Thank thrown you. into Thank the you. mix at the end like they often do because people just usually go that narrative. I think this tight end class, I remember Matt and I talking two years ago and we said, this could be the best tight end class. You know, we could do the draft stuff. We could do Saturday, Sunday for decades and Evan Ingram and Njoku and OJ Howard. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. might never see another tight end class like this. Well, it took two years right. because I think this class is on par, at least, with that year's class in terms of I think they're three worthy first-round picks. Some disagree with Irv Smith. We had a long conversation with Waldman last week about how much he likes them and we like them. I think three guys are round one worthy, and then I think there's a whole plethora of intriguing guys who could go on day two, and some probably even fall to day three with this class. What is your take as a whole? And then you can just start digging into the top guys and share some thoughts on them. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's another situation where the NFL is in the right mindset to take advantage of what these players can offer. And it absolutely is a, a position that is above, well above average in terms of quality at the top, in terms of depth. Um, and you it, just like running back, just like wide receiver, just like quarterback, true, truly. There's variety, and I love something you said during our running back segment that depending on the team, and this is the real exercise for the draft nick. You know, I don't have as much time as I used to to really delve into being a draft nick and just swim in it and think it all day and night. Most of us don't, but if you it, the 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 next level is understanding the players to the point where you could say okay, put together a board for the Ravens. What would it look like? Put together a board for the Patriots. What would it look like? Put together a board for the Rams. What would it look like? Uh, And and of course, some of that takes understanding of the team's roster and philosophy and so on. But then that gives us clarity. The old board, Matt Waldman and I talked about this, where the, uh, the board where you just rank guys from one to 30, it's not useful anymore. It's, it's not saying anything meaningful when you're comparing different players and saying, well, I'm ranking him fifth and him sixth. I think breaking out into tiers and understanding their relative NFL value is is something that adds understanding. But otherwise, these players offer something very different. And as long as a team is self-assessing well, they'll understand that this player is going to help us a lot more than this player. And the tight end class has, even among the top three, very different profiles, very different players in the NFL. Um, You know, Noah Fant is maybe a little more Jared Cook than Evan Ingram, but that same sort of player again, detached from the formation, mismatch, size, speed, athleticism, mismatches. You'd love to see more of his game after the catch come into focus, but uh, as a weapon, and it's positionless football, right? So running backs, we care about them as receivers as much as we do as runners. Tight ends, we care about them as receivers as much as we do as block uh, as blockers and so on. Um, so TJ Hawkinson is going to give you that two-way ability and a standing blocker. And you see TJ Hawkinson do things that are just catnip for offensive coordinators. Well, you'll see him neutralize two defenders on the same play, or you'll see him really be able to locate that player in space at the second level. That is the difference between an eight yard play and a 25 yard play. Uh, it, so those things absolutely add value, even though because of the fantasy football mindset that I'm part of promoting, you don't they don't show up on the stat sheet for a player. And then Irv Smith, who 
you know, I think you want to, if you want to take Irv Smith in the first round, you maybe point to OJ Howard and say, well, Alabama didn't use him as much as a receiver as they could have, but look at how much unmined, untapped value there was there. But then you go to that next level of players and you have your guys that are uh, athletic. Um, Jay Sternberger is really interesting to watch. Ja- Dawson Knox is a really interesting guy to watch too, because he was in the shadow of those receivers at Ole Miss. Uh, but athletically, he looks fantastic. He flashes some skills. Um, even somebody like Josh Oliver, and, you know, these are projectable receiving tight ends. But then you have some really nice two-way tight ends. Like uh, I love Dax Raymond. I think Dax Raymond is a, an excellent, useful player in every aspect of the game. He, very coordinated. Um, another upside guy, uh, Kahali Waring from San Diego State. He's one of those players that is in the top 10 or 20 of gaining value, at least in terms of perception during the draft season, right? If you and I have this conversation, Back in January, Paul, he's 15th, 20th, 25th ranked tight end. He could be the fourth or fifth tight end off of the board because of how projectable he is physically and how much there is potential, at least for growth in his game. So whether you're looking for that useful player, Foster Moreau is another interesting guy because you know what you're getting as a blocker, but there could be a lot more there as a receiver, at least as a functional receiver. So there are players, if you're emphasizing the blocking part or if you're emphasizing inline uh, or if you're emphasizing more of a move tight end and a receiving weapon and, and physical tools. So again, what tight ends these teams target will tell us a lot. Like whenever the Saints took Jimmy Graham, who barely played a lick of football in the third round because of what he projected as as a receiver, that showed you how they envisioned their tight end position in their offense. And I think we'll learn similarly about other teams' offenses depending on the tight end they pick out of this excellent class. Yeah, I mean, this the, the fascination with this class is great. I mean, TJ Hawkinson, I think, has a legitimate chance to go to the Lions at eight. Sure. Like, you know, maybe Matt Patricia can't, you know, help himself and wants one of the defensive guys. But he also soared the value of Gronk in that Patriots offense. And while he might not be the next Gronkowski because that's setting up anybody for failure, he saw what Gronkowski brought at, in the run game in terms of his blocking ability and then the impact he could have as a receiver. And it's obvious that the Lions and would Patricia there want to be able to run the football. And Hawkinson would add a very different dynamic to A, the run game, and then be, you know, a little bit more versatility and uniqueness to their offense, which could potentially open things up for Kenny Galladay, you know, Marvin Jones, you know, and, and really jumpstart that offense a little bit, a little bit more to maybe what Patricia wants there. So I think he's in play at eight. I think he could be in play for the Bills at nine. You know, I think he could be in play for the Packers at 12 after their free agent frenzy on the defense. Maybe they decide to add an offensive piece to the puzzle. So Hawkinson's intriguing. Fant, like you said, that intriguingness of, of being that Jared Cook type, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, the athleticism, you know, in a, in a different way, but comparable to a Vernon Davis or an Evan Ingram. I have a, a some hesitation, you know, in terms of Noah Fant's immediate transition, very similar to I had with David Njoku, that if you put too much on his plate and ask him to do a little bit too much, I do think he's route running and route development and route refinement needs some work. So I think you got to be specific in terms of how you want to use Noah Fant. I think if you want the really good route runner, I think last week Waltman, you know, said he sees Delaney Walker with Irv Smith. I could totally get on board with that in terms of his route refinement, his route understanding, and a very willing and able blocker in Irv Smith Jr. So I think the top is unique. I'm so glad you brought up Cahill Warren because he's a guy like you talked about. You know, Matt and I pride ourselves on knowing a wide variety of college names over years of, of, of watching these guys. And he was not a guy we watched during the summer. He's not a guy we had added early on to our notebooks during the season. And then the, the season started to come to a close and you started to hear some guys who's going to declare who's not. And someone mentioned Kyle Warren out of San Diego state. And I was like, huh, he's going to declare early. Don't know anything about him, put on some film about him and came away really impressed that, you know, he immediately after watching him jumped into that, you know, six to 10 range, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and now has only continued to, to kind of climb up after more film became available because sometimes we're just prisoners to what's available and what's out there without having such a wide, you know, scope of, of the film. And we got to kind of wait to see what's, what's out there. And then you saw him at the combine really impressive. So I think, 
him, Dawson Knox, Sternberger, Oliver, they could all potentially be top 100 guys. You know, maybe one or two fall to, you know, to, to round four. You know, all intriguing. I'm intrigued by Alze Mack out of Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. That's I think, not a good name, yeah. I think he, I've been saying for a couple months now that he's my Christopher Herndon in this draft class. Last year, I felt like Herndon was being slept on. More for him because he wasn't able to do anything in the pre-draft process, but I thought he had a lot of at- untapped athleticism and receiving ability. It's kind of how I feel about Alzey Mack this year. So he's a guy who's way down people's boards, I think, and he could be another intriguing guy that you know goes round four, goes round five, and I think can make a name for himself sooner rather than later. And then I'm glad you brought up Dax Raymond. You can throw Drew Sample, Foster Moreau may be a guy that has a lot of untapped upside. Tommy Sweeney could be a really good rock solid number two tight end at the next level. Really deep class. Uh, it's going to be fun to see because like normally like 18 to 20 tight ends go. I look at this board and I think to myself, 18 tight ends could go in the first five rounds. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how many fall and the value that could be there on day three could be tremendous, especially with how great of a defensive draft it is. You know, and then in particular, I'll use this as our transition point. How wide a vast variety of wide receiver class it is, is is what's so fascinating about this. And as we transition to that wide receiver, I was privileged last week to be on the Harris Football Podcast talking specifically about the wide receiver class. And Chris and I continue to talk about this wide receiver class is so unique that the range of outcomes for just about every wide receiver could go from role player to really good NFL player for so many of the top guys that it, it's amazing. I don't remember such a wide variety of guys, even at the top with a guy like DK Metcalf, and we'll get to him momentarily. There's such a wide range of potential outcomes that makes it such a fascinating class. And there's no, there's no uniformity in terms of rankings. Like you talk to five different people, maybe six, you could have five or six yeah. different people at the top of their boards, right. you know, in terms of the way they structure it. And I never could remember that, you know, for a position, especially at the wide receiver position, maybe one or two names could be in consideration for the top wide receiver, not five or six. So the wide receiver position maybe a little bit of an outline in terms of what you kind of think of sure. it as a whole. And then we'll start digging into some individual guys. Yeah. And just a postscript on tight ends. We saw Cause we're always watching at this time of year, how teams are valuing positions. And we saw a lot of names that some people would say, who get three years, 18 million in free agency, at tight end more than Tevin Coleman got, you know, uh, whoever, no one says who, when they say Tevin Coleman, he, he's been one of the more prolific touchdown scorers at running back uh, over the last four years. So teams care about tight end more than we do. And this class, like you said, you know, I think 10 in the top 100, 15 by the end of the fourth round, 18, 20 by the end of the fifth round. Absolutely. And what's really fun about this is, again, in the background, um, what occurs to me, Paul, you know, those things where they say, look at this grid of letters and the first two words you see describe your personality or something like that. That's kind of the draft for teams, right? Look at this vast field of players. Which players stand out to you as a team says something about your personality as a team. And that's what's fun about the variety at all these positions. Now, wide receiver, as you said, I think you nailed one of the best things to understand at the top of this class, how to make sense out of it. Because Daniel Jeremiah, fantastic says i can see only one wide receiver going in the first round and let it be said that i see more and more of a drumbeat that one wide receiver might be marquise brown and when you watched you mentioned that uh, oklahoma alabama game and marquise brown was not right in that game and you wonder and i forget who it was who brought it up to me on twitter because i was like man sometimes kyler murray you do see him look a little overwhelmed early on in that game and it makes you say hmm, when things get a little tougher is he gonna be overwhelmed at least at first uh, but it was pointed out to me that, hey if Marquise Brown was healthy for that game, it might have been a little different. And as you said, he adjusted to Marquise Brown not being out there. But that gives you an idea. Marquise Brown, number one on some boards. Uh, and Kiel Harry, number one on some boards. A.J. Brown, number one on some boards. Some people might even have J.J. Arcega Whiteside close to number one on their boards. And he's a good example of the polarizing nature of some of these players. So what does that tell me? Um, first of all, that the wide receiver position and Bill Belichick was one of the first to just come out and say, it's too difficult. 
We'd rather trade for a guy or sign a guy after we've watched him play on Sunday because we know what we're getting because we found it to be difficult to really project accurately how these players are going to translate to the NFL. And what we do find with wide receivers, it, it, it's the way those things integrate, right? Because some people are watching Hakeem Butler, another guy who's number one on some boards, and saying, well, if he can make some scrub defensive back uh, miss a tackle or break his tackle, that's fine. But can he beat the kind of press coverage he's going to see in the NFL, right? So what becomes important for a player to translate can just be one thing, right? You can just see one thing or maybe a player's ball tracking like Sammy Coates. One thing can make a player just fall apart in the NFL. So it's a difficult position sometimes to understand how when you take this set of skills and traits and put it in the context of the next level, what are you going to get? And then the other side of that is NFL application, right? Cooper Cup. We all think Cooper Cup is a fantastic receiver, right? Imagine if Cooper Cup had gone to Jacksonville or Buffalo. Will we be talking about Cooper Cup? No, probably a very different story. So what team these receivers land on and how they are used is also going to determine so much of their future. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a fun pos- it's position because of the variety when people are evaluating it and you're much like these teams, it's almost like a personality test. If Hakeem Butler is your number one wide receiver, you value this, this, and this. If AJ Brown is your number one wide receiver, you value this, this, this. If it's Harry, this, this, and this. If it's Metcalf, this, this, and this, because they're very different from each other. And may we pray, Paul, (laughs) that the teams that draft these receivers see them accurately and use them in a way that gives them the best chance of success. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so important in terms of putting these guys in, in the right position to be successful because there is no uniformity. There is no guy that, you know, I think you can put him in any offense, any scheme, and he's probably right. going to succeed. There might be one or two guys who emerge into that, but I don't think you, I don't think anybody can watch your film right now and say a hundred percent certainty. I think that's going to happen. You know, Let's start with DK Metcalf for a second because yeah. the, the, what I've been saying about him is that he's not a top my board. He's in my top five, but he's not a top my board. And you watch DK Metcalf, and I could understand someone saying he's a bigger, stronger, faster, but he's Ted Ginn in terms of his role at the NFL level. And then I could say see somebody else saying he's Josh Gordon at the at the next level in terms of because of the physicality, size, and, and potential usage. Or I could see somewhere in the middle because with him, I think – It is a little bit intriguing that Ole Miss didn't ask him to do nearly as much as what they asked of A.J. Brown. They asked A.J. Brown to run option receiver routes. They ran the offense through A.J. Brown. They mostly kept D.K. Metcalf on one side of the field and asked him to run maybe three or four different routes, mostly vertical routes, you know, a a couple other things here and there, very minimal in terms of changing direction type stuff. So is that just because that is what worked or did they see some limitations that, that led, you know, them to believe that he couldn't be that successful on some other stuff. And what does an NFL team ask of him? Because if an NFL team brings him in and says they want him to be the true number one guy that he could, he should be able to beat double teams and run the entire route tree, you know, and be the focal point of, of, of the defense's attention. I'm not sure he's going to be successful in that role, especially early on. But if he goes somewhere where he's the second guy and I keep coming back to if the Packers took him at the end of round one. With all the attention that Devontae Adams gets, Devontae Adams has proven to be a transcendent talent, has proven to be able to beat double teams, top defensive cornerbacks, you know, beat the focal point of the defense. And he's playing on the other side. Well, then I think we could see immediate success at the next level, and he could be a huge, impactful player in that role. But I worry that if he goes somewhere where he's the guy, maybe there could be a little bit of a growth and developmental waiting period that we have to see. What do you kind of see with DK? Yeah, I think that you laid out the framework really well. And Stephen White, SGW94, I think is his handle on Twitter, the former defensive lineman for the Bucks. He does really tremendous evaluations because it's all sound football thinking, but there's an enthusiasm and an excitement that a lot of us share that comes through in the way he writes about uh, these players. And his point about DK Metcalf is a good one to at least start the discussion is sure DK Metcalf is not going to carve all of the branches on the route tree. Sure. You're going to basically 
only use him in like hitches and go routes or posts or you know very not routes that are requiring a lot of subtlety you know but that's okay because that's what he's that's what you do with him and as you were saying if you're trying to do these other things with him not that teams don't make these kinds of mistakes then you're you're missing the point of taking a DK Metcalf. And I think you're right to bring up the Packers, not just because of Devontae Adams, but because Aaron Rodgers can extend plays, because Aaron Rodgers is an aggressive thinker as a quarterback, and because Aaron Rodgers has the arm talent to make those deep throws. So, you know, if the Cardinals, for instance, take DK Metcalf at the top of the second after taking Kyler Murray at the top of the first and pairing him with Christian Kirk, that sounds good. You know, um, you I, I compared... Uh, you know, looking at the at AJ Brown versus DK Metcalf because there's a real that, that's a kind of a good draft prop at this point. I don't think it's clear who's going to go first. AJ Brown could be the first wide receiver off the board in this draft. And I compared um, DK Metcalf, Paul, to a big broadsword. It's heavy. You got to wind up to swing it. But man, if you have the opening and you swing it well, you can take someone's head off with it. You know. Where D- AJ Brown is a little more of a of a dagger or something where you can work in short range or maybe like a light sword where you can do damage a lot of different ways. Maybe not lethal damage, but the death by a thousand paper cuts or some of the stuff that Juju Smith Schuster has done. And so I compared Brown to. So you know, with DK Metcalf, you you take this metaphor, this tortured metaphor, and I'm I love torturing metaphors. It's one of my hobbies. That if you have an offense or a quarterback who can't swing the broadsword. You know, an offensive line who doesn't give the quarterback time to make those deep throws or and so on, then he's going to be useless. He doesn't have a wide range of applications, but the application he does have can turn games when it's done well. Yeah, I mean, I love that. I love what you just talked about, the outlining Metcalf versus A.J. Brown, because I think you're right. Very different stylistic players. Metcalf is a guy who can make that big play, game-breaking play, but Brown, to me, offers more versatility, more consistency, a guy who you know could show up on the stat sheet with eight catches for 110 yards, and DK might be three catches for 140 yards. So they're, they're very different stylistically in terms of it's a little bit going back to what you want and what you need, what's already there in your offense. You brought up Arizona, but you have Christian Kirk, who might be more of that versatile guy. So maybe for them, DK Metcalf is the guy. Other teams, it could be we have that vertical component. We have that maybe guy that we want more of the versatility, and we bring in an A.J. Brown. I think it's a great, fascinating question. Let's bring up some other names, and I'll start here because I think he's the most polarizing player and the most unique in terms of really good, opinionated people that I trust tremendously. I never in my lifetime could remember a player where the scope of discussion is wider than Hakeem Butler yeah. from third round 10, 12th best wide receiver in the class to other really respected people, best wide receiver in the class, top 15 talent overall in the entire class. Where do you kind of fall yeah. on him? I've used your comparison, giving you credit on Twitter and multiple podcasts about the Plaxico Burris comp sure. in terms of what you see. I think it's a great comp. So I'm assuming you're a little bit more on the see him towards the top yes. of the wide receiver board than the people who see him in that 10, 12 range. But before you even give your thoughts on him, why do you think there's so much disparity and such a wide range? Have you been able to kind of piece together? For, I know you do such a great job with that. Sure. Or why maybe there's such a wide disparity? Well, I think it's all the different ways that people evaluate the position um, and in general evaluate draft prospects, Paul. And this is great because for as long as we've been doing this, we've seen these conversations evolve. And I think that there's a lot of different schools of thought. I also always uh, compared draft Twitter to an academic department at a university where people are publishing their work, they're tearing down each other's work, they're stealing or borrowing from each other's work, they're taking each other's work one step further, and everybody has different approaches. And no single approach is the answer. And in fact, what you might stress more at the wide receiver position might be the key to unlocking this wide receiver prospect, but give you no insight to this other wide receiver prospect, and vice versa. So people are, are caring about production. People are caring about age. People are caring about the age a player broke out. People are care- and then and then when you get into the specifics, people are caring about releases. People are caring about route running. People are caring about your game at the catch point. And everybody has a, a different 
you know, you can think of these little dials where you're tweaking, like 25% of my evaluation is this, 5%. Maybe people couldn't articulate this, but this is what everybody who's coming up with these armchair evaluations are doing. And because it, depending on what you emphasize, Hakeem Butler presents such a different picture, that's where you get this wide range. And I think that for me, I love Hakeem Butler because whether it's Plasco Burris, I think AJ Green belongs in this conversation. Um, what I see immediately, and sometimes when it comes to wide receiver, Paul, I'm just, I'm reflexive. I see something within a couple of plays of watching a player and I will say, whoa, or I will say, you know, for instance, with JJ Arcega Whiteside, I'll say monotone runner. And I can't, I, I can't remember the last monotone runner at wide receiver who outperformed expectations in the NFL. I mean, I mean I'm sure there's some, and I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but my point is when you watch a keen Butler, what you see is, this rare combination of a long limb body, which makes it very difficult to defend him at the catch point because he also can present a big frame and understand instinctively how to get between the defender and the ball in flight. So he's just sometimes he can just checkmate you at the catch point because of how long limbed he is and explosive he is as a leaper. But he's also functionally strong when it comes time to square off with someone in the open field. He breaks tackles. He also can elude tacklers. He can add value after the catch. And he's fast. He's fast enough to maybe make the corner open his hips a little early because you're afraid of that speed. Because forget about defending him at the catch point. How are you defending him at the catch point downfield on an island when it's one-on-one? You know, that's going to make a defensive back very nervous. Now, some of the finer points as a route runner as and releases, concentrate, trace, and drops. Drops is a good polarize. Drops is another one, Paul. Some people might say too many drops. And then we have Matt Waldman and others coming in and saying, well, what kind of drops are they? Are they drops that are technique-based? Are they drops that can be coached? Are they drops that are even ball tracking based where I don't know how you teach that or they drops that are concentration focus drops, which we often see in concert with a receiver who's big and dominant at the catch point who gets a lot of volume and adds a lot of value after the catch control Owens, Brandon Marshall. These guys would have eight, nine, 10 ca- concentration drops a year because they're thinking about what's coming next. And they add so much about in what's coming next that you'll excuse it. So I just see a very rare type at that number one, who presents mismatches, who adds value after the catch, who can win deep, who can create chunk plays on short passes. I see so many possibilities with Akeem Butler. And this is where I'll put on my Homer hat and say, as a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, if Devin Bush doesn't fall, I would love to hear Hakeem Butler be that name, but maybe he'll be there for them in the second round. Yeah, I mean, I think Butler's fascinating, and I'll put on my homer cap too. I mean, could he could he be a more perfect complement to the Giants' wide receiving corps than any team, than just about anybody? I mean, or, the Giants have a bunch of midgets who I love, but I mean, every wide receiver on the Giants' roster that you know five eleven and five, sure. you know, so he'd be that guy. But even you said it, he'd be perfect in Pittsburgh, you know, complementing. Juju Smith, I mean, Juju Smith, James Washington, he'd be a guy that would kind of complete that wide receiving corpse now with Antonio Brown no longer there. And it's going to be fascinating to see what the NFL thinks of him. Has right. he been one of those guys that the NFL is just like, huh, kind of liking that some aspects of the media aren't talking about him much. He might fall to us in round two or a late round one pick, the surprise round one pick like a Richard Penny last year. You know, and we know Pittsburgh – Based on their first round pick last year, they're not opposed to be going against the green and being a little bit unique. So, you know, so I think he's so fascinating in that regards. And maybe we'll get a little bit more clearer of a picture in terms of what the NFL thinks about him based on where he goes. It could be one of those things that they're just kind of keep, you know, somebody seems to just keeping it under wraps and maybe enjoying the fact that there is this discrepancy with some people thinking this and other people thinking that and hoping that maybe he pushes down the board a little bit. It's going to be, he's going to be a fun follow, especially if he doesn't go off the board in round one. I think he's one of the more intriguing storylines on day two, you know, and see, is it round two? Is it early round two? Does he fall to round three? Where does he go? I think is a really fascinating story. Two other wide receivers I want to bring up, and then I'll give you the floor to kind of close it out if there's any other guys that you're really high on and you just want to go uh, rapid fire. I'm really intrigued by two guys who sit in my top five. I don't think they're getting 
So I think they're going a little bit under the radar. And the first one is Debo Samuel. I think going back to Matt's problem solving paradigm and Ben Fennel, who we had on the show recently put, has been putting up some stuff of uh, Debo Samuel over the last 48 hours or so. I think he potentially is the best problem solver at the wide receiver position in this class in terms of variety of ways he can win and impact a game from the wide receiver position inside outside, you know, manufacture touches, route running, kick returning, versatility. I'm, I'm really intrigued by him. I, you know, I mentioned to me, he's a little bit of a blend of like Jarvis Landry in terms of his size and play strength. And then Debo Samuel in terms of what you want to, I'm not, sorry, Debo Samuel, DJ Moore from last year in terms of variety and uniqueness to his game and athleticism. So I see him as like a blend of those two guys. And then Calvin Harmon, who, if I remember correctly, I believe a while back, you said you had, I think, some separation uh, yeah. quickness and concerns with. And I think those are viable. But my thing with Calvin Harmon, and you brought it up, I think, really well before with J.J. or Siegel Whiteside, is when I watch Calvin Harmon, I see a little bit different from him to Arcega Whiteside is I don't see that one speed. I think he does. A, I think he's more technical savvy in terms of a his route running, his usage of his hands and his ability to play at different speeds. I think his play speed is definitely better in my opinion than what we saw at the combine. And to me, he reminds me a lot of a Hakeem Nick style player. And they actually test yeah. that really similarly in terms of size, athleticism, et cetera, et cetera. I think Calvin Harmon, to me, is so effective on that back shoulder throw that the quarterback that maybe Harmon gets placed with, if that's something he does well, like Eli Manning in his prime was very good at that. Aaron Rodgers, very good at that. He's very good at, at that aspect. And I thought that was what uh, an area where Hakeem Nick shined in. So I think they're going a little bit under the radar. And I think both of them, probably Debo Samuel, maybe is around two pick. I think Calvin Harmon could be sitting there on round three. And I think he presents really good value. Yeah, I'm going to echo what you say about Samuel. And Samuel and A.J. Brown are um, similar when you're trying to group out this class. because And one of the signature, the calling cards of, of even Samuel more than Brown is just that toughness and physicality. I like you bringing up the name Jarvis Landry because it's just playing a game with a toughness and physicality and edge and being able to work a lot of different parts of the field and a lot of different roles. Uh, Debo Samuel is going to be a fantastic NFL player. He's, it, 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 you know, Paul, I like to just say as shorthand, there are certain players in the draft that whenever they go off the board, whoever they go off the board to, you'll say good pick. You know, Debo Samuel is a late first round pick to the Patriots or you know, good pick. Does you know? Oh, that no, not a reach. I don't care. Uh, Debo Samuel is going to be a good pick. Um, and Harmon, and it's interesting to group Harmon and Harry together because these are both players that have not just a physical edge, but sometimes they play the bully. But uh, you don't see them winning a lot in terms of creating separation. But I think you're right that Harmon changes speeds and has more of a subtlety. And A.J. Brown is excellent at changing speeds. I love that you bring that up. I think that one of the most overlooked things about a wide receiver is not necessarily his speed on get off or his speed through his brakes or second gear or whatever. It's changing speeds to set up the defender. And I think you do see Harmon do that more than you see our Sega Whiteside and more than you see Harry. Harry's a great example of a guy that, you know, winning at the catch point, uh, uh, just it's almost unfair sometimes. Like I, I compared it, I think to like a, a solar eclipse. Like Harry just blots out the guy trying to defend him when the ball is incoming. But if you ask him to create separation as a route runner, you're you're barking up the wrong tree. And I think that um, and Harmon I've heard compared to Anquan Bolden. And I mean Anquan Bolden's one of those players that we don't want to shorthand like every wide receiver who doesn't have straight line speed and can't create a lot of separation. Well, he can be Anquan Bolden, but he does have that physical edge. Uh, that Bolden had. So, yeah, I think you're right to bring up, again, the idea also of the quarterback. Other names I just want to toss out there yeah. that, that people, that, like you said, just to kind of wind up the position, that I don't want to say people associate with me because it's not about me. It's about the players. But receivers who I think haven't gotten enough time or ink, and some of it's because of how deep this class is, and some of it's because of where these guys played. Um, you know, I like Antoine Wesley more than Ar Arcega Whiteside. I think Antoine Wesley gives you the length and the ability to win the catch point with a lot more after the catch and a lot more potential as a route runner. Um, I love Penny Hart. 
and Penny Hart is right there with Ozigbo, is why this guy did not get a combine in fight is beyond me. And I don't care what his measurables were because you could watch him at the senior bowl practices. And that was very important for a small school player. The senior bowl, the combine, very important for small school players to show they can hang. And Penny Hart more than hung at the senior bowl. And there's a whole group of undersized receivers in this class, right? Andy Isabella and Greg Dortch and, and, and so on and so forth. Down line, Mark Hollywood Brown, Miko Hardman. And I think Hart is going to, translate as that slot receiver who just creates easy five, seven, eight yard gains by creating early separation in, in the play. And just, I mean, I would love, I saw that the Colts had him in for a visit, Paul. Oh yeah. Give me that element in the, in the Colts offense, please, please. I think Penny Hart is a player that's going to translate very much. Uh, I, I, Jalen Hurd, I've talked about on a couple of different shows. I just think he presents a really interesting combination of an actual viable short yardage runner, but somebody who's got size and athleticism and is just scratching the surface as a, a wide receiver. Um, I'll mention Tyree Brady out of Marshall just because I saw a combination of speed and fluid athleticism and refinement at the catch point, the ability of body control and things that I think if you put some of his plays next to Harry who gets the gold ribbon in that category, you know, he can hang with him. Um, so it's just, there's, there's so many, I mean, we haven't mentioned miles Boykin who's had an, may, maybe the best postseason of any wide receiver. Uh, what he's done at the combine, I think has gotten him into the, that's that you want to put your most likely Steelers pick a wide receiver, uh, especially at that early third. If he's there for the early third they got from Oakland, there's your replacement for Antonio Brown. There's all these small school guys like Jazz Ferguson, uh, Ashton Doolin. Um, so it's 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 so, so good. And I think, Paul, you and I and everybody else who study this position, at the end of the draft, there are going to be guys that are going to say, why wasn't this guy drafted? Uh, because it's that deep. It's that good. And, um, you know, it's just, it's again, so many layers to the draft. I, I think that your audience, like our audience on the audible, it's a very, uh, cerebral and deep thinking football audience. And when you are that kind of fan of the game and you take the time to listen to shows like this and understand the prelude to these players NFL careers and then the, there's the cliffhanger of the draft who do they go to what when do they go off the board but that's really a, a, and it's a cliffhanger that releases an adrenaline and excitement but that's actually just the prelude to the real story of their careers and how it intersects with the careers of other players and coaches and how it intersects with the destiny of these organizations and taking the time out to have these kind of discussions. And I thank your audience and our audience that has created a demand for this level of discourse about football. It's so rewarding at every step of the process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to echo how deep this wide receiver class is, I know I'm in the finishing stages of putting out the final uh, notebook for Saturday to Sunday, the draft projections notebook, where I try to – gather every single source possible and kind of project and predict how it's going to go. Not my personal rankings. Those are already out there, but how I expect it to go by position, you know, a guess at the top, you know, 32 to top three rounds, which I think this year is 102. And then my guess at every single pick in the draft. And it is amazing when I, when I'm working and the one position I have left to still finish is the wide receiver position because I am struggling with the order in which I, uh, they can go off the board. And then two struggling to how many I'm like getting into like the 34, 35 amount, which I kind of is kind of like the historical average, which I, I use as at least a starting point in terms of going up or down in terms of how many I project going off the board on the entire draft. And I'm like, wow, that guy's not going to get picked. That guy's not going to get picked. Like, is that like, is that what I'm going to put out there and project? And it's like, the wide receiver position, there is going to be names in that the, we'll call it the eighth round, the undrafted part of the draft that you're going to be, I think people who are big fans are going to be blown away with. They're going to be there 
you know, Saturday night at nine o'clock and you're going to see things stream across Twitter. It said, this guy is signed, you know, as a UDFA here. And you'll be like, wow, I thought he could have went in the round five as a wide receiver. I don't think that's going to be all that surprising this year because of the depth of this wide receiver class, which makes it for a fascinating, fascinating weekend and post-draft, even with the wide receiver class in particular, with just how many good guys aren't going to go in the, in the seven rounds and are going to make it to the UDF portion. It's going to be fascinating to, to follow that. Sigmund, this was an absolute pleasure. We went over time. We went almost an hour 25. Uh, I felt like we were basically recording an episode of On the Couch. Because yeah. we, went, we went deep. We covered players, but we covered more than just players. We, can, we, we covered big topics, digging deep in the positions, in the stories. And that's just what we love to do here at Saturday to Sunday. And I know you appreciate and love that too. So thank you so much uh, for joining me, Sig. Let ob- obviously everybody know where they can find your work, if you guys are working on anything, what you guys are going to be doing for the draft coverage and all that stuff. Yeah, well, footballguys.com and um, the draft kind of uh, kicks off our year. Uh, things will go live, our, our app, uh, and so on. And just, uh, you know, uh, I'll have to post draft Bloom 100. We'll do live Matt Walden and I and a cast of characters on the first, during the first round, one of our favorite traditions. So of course, um, and I'm guessing a lot of the people in your audience should already know Matt Waldman and know our stuff. So it's great to have the opportunity to engage with you and engage with an audience that really cares about those big picture things, because tell me who's going to take him or tell me if he's going to be good or not. That's one level of draft coverage. And of course we want to touch on those things, but getting into the meat of why this game is so engrossing and fascinating for us and going through all these different steps on the calendar and watching and analyzing and anticipating, speculating, and comparing our thoughts to what really happens. That's what keeps the fuel in our tank year after year after year, right, Paul? Like, how do we not get bored? Because it's always changing because the, the problem is always changing. The, the terms of engagement, what these teams are willing to do, the cast of characters, how innovative thinkers the team builders are, um, the, the, how cap economics and all this stuff plays in. There's so many layers and angles and have an audience like your audience, like our audience that encourages us to go deep is, is a real joy and pleasure and always a real joy and pleasure to interact with people like you and Matt and so many other in our little sandbox that we, we just enjoy this. We enjoy, we're stimulated by it. We're stimulated by each other and to continue to do this year after year is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. I echo everything you just said. It is. Listen, it's fun saying he's a round two guy. He's that. But digging in deep and, and looking at the further why and answering the why and thinking about it in terms of that, you know, Matt always talks about that player problem solving paradigm. Now, I think it's taking the, the level of evaluation to the next level. And I think for people who enjoy every component of the draft it basically is fueling the fire of why we don't get bored because it's never the same. It's always evolving. It's always developing. We're changing. We're evolving as we evaluate and we try to dig deep and, and, and see what the NFL is looking for and why they might do a certain thing makes it new and fresh every single year. And it's absolutely fascinating. So a hundred percent agree with you there. So guys, make sure you get over to the football guys, check out everything, listen to on the couch, the audible, all that stuff. Excellent coverage as always. If you, been enjoying what Matt and I have been putting out on the podcast on Twitter, please make sure you get over to the website. The quickest way now is ssfootball.com. Click on the premium content tab, and for $9.99, you get access to all four notebooks, including the scouting notebook, which over 100 player profiles, how they win, strengths, solve problems, draft projection, all that, the rankings notebook, all our different rankings, and then still to be released, soon the freshman notebook which will have player profiles on the top 30 to 50 incoming freshmen and then the draft projections notebook as matt references it the best tv guide for draft weekend in terms of how it could go down i am striving hard to try to beat last year when i predict predicted 28 out of 32 of the names to be announced on round one 85 out of the top 100 and 202 out of the 256. Wow. I'll see what I can do this year. It's a little bit more of an intriguing year, but we're going to see what we can do. So on behalf of SIG, on behalf of Matt, on behalf of our sound and tech engineer, David Nakano, and myself, thank you for joining us. And we look forward next time taking you from Saturday to Sunday.